Well, hello and good morning from my time zone. It's Christy, and welcome to Heroines of the Gynocracy. Heroines of the Gynocracy! This is the companion show, or sister show, to This Week in Stupid Misogynists. Having done This Week in Stupid Misogynists for six weeks now, I've realized that the content can be pretty heavy and that I need to take a break. In order to maintain the kinds of content that I'm covering, I've decided to add this once in a while series, periodic series, to offer some more positive and uplifting stories just for an entire episode. And so welcome to Heroines of the Gynocracy. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the concept of gynocracy, it's not an academic term, it's not a theoretical term. It was a word that was made up by people outside of the social sciences, outside of academia, who want to have some sort of polar opposite to the idea of patriarchy. And from my understanding of this made-up term, because again, it wasn't observed inductively and then elevated to the point of theory through repeated observation and analysis, living in a gynocracy means that women are the subject of benevolent sexism, and somehow this benevolent sexism gives us privilege in life, despite the fact that historically and even up until today, men own the vast majority of global wealth, they run the vast majority of companies worldwide, they dominate legislative bodies and executive positions worldwide, and they run all of the major religions. Therefore, the idea of women wielding power over men strikes me as a bit ridiculous. With that background, let's go ahead and look at some of the women who have been elected to political positions, because I want to highlight some of their efforts and the work that they're doing in order to advance the gynocracy. Scotland becomes the first nation to give free access to sanitary products. A six-month initiative, which is being rolled out across a number of regeneration areas in Aberdeen, will be used to make a case for future Scottish government policies on sanitary product provision. Run by poverty prevention and social enterprise charity Community Food Initiatives Northeast, the pilot will first be offered to women's health and housing charities, as well as for schools, with a view to extending the program universally should the results support such a move. The pilot comes after Gillian Martin, MSP, and Julie Hepburn, the SNP's political education convener, had a resolution passed at the SNP National Council. Further developments later arose after Ms. Martin worked with Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance, MSP. The Scottish Government and Seafine Project comes just under a year after Scotland's Labour's Inequity Spokesperson Monica Lennon, MSP, called for the government to make a firm commitment to looking into the affordability of sanitary products with a view to making them free to all women in Scotland. The issues around sanitary products for women is something that is an interesting one. It's been coming up more often now than I've really seen before, although it's sort of been underlying in feminist critique for quite a while. The issue here is, of course, menstruation is a bodily function. Women are going to experience it. And I've also been aware for a while of programs that are especially targeted toward homeless women who have a real struggle with one just finding the products they need because they're quite expensive. I think um, someone was saying that a box of Tampax in the United States and some urban areas can run up to six dollars. And that's for, I think, probably around 30 or 40 tampons, which if you're being hygienic and changing them every few hours is enough to you know last you maybe about one cycle or one and a half cycles so for a homeless woman that's a real physical barrier not only to obtain the products but then also just to stay clean and hygienic and not feel gross I haven't really thought too much about making sanitary products free for all women everywhere. I am aware that some public buildings have started moving toward providing free sanitary products rather than selling them. It's a topic that I think is worth discussing a little bit more and hearing what both sides have to say. And here's how the gynocracy spends its time, power, and influence providing free sanitary products to women in economically deprived areas and situations.
Now the next story, I don't really like the headline because the headline is undermined when you read the first line of the article, but I can't do anything about the headline that the editor gave this piece, so I will just read it out. What is stealthing, and why do lawmakers in California and Wisconsin want to classify it as rape? Two lawmakers are trying to change their state's legislation to explicitly classify the willful removal of a condom without the consent of the sexual partner as a form of sexual assault. California State Assembly member for District 58, Christina Garcia, is seeking to expand the definition of rape under California law to include the practice known as stealthing. Stealthing is rape, said Garcia, presenting the bill on Monday. Penetration without consent is rape. Wisconsin State Representative Melissa Sargent is also focusing on the issue of consent in her bill, which was also submitted on Monday. Under the bill, if an actor removes a sexually protective device such as a condom before or during sexual intercourse or other sexual contact without his or her partner's permission, there has been no valid consent to that sexual act, the proposed legislation reads. While stealthing is neither a new practice nor a newly coined terminology, it became a subject of discussion in mainstream media after the April 20th publication of the study Rape Adjacent, Imagining Legal Responses to Non-Consensual Condom Removal by Alexandra Brodsky, Skaden Fellow at the National Women's Law Center and Yale Law School alumna. As Brodsky notes in her research, stealthing is not only a common and unreported practice, it has been actively encouraged amongst misogynistic online communities as a way to assert sexual dominance over women. Quote, Stealthing is another sign that some men think they can still own our bodies. I hope all the men out there blogging away are paying attention, because in California, we're going to lead the nation in ending the trend now, Garcia said on Monday. The U.S. is not the only country lacking clear legislation. Earlier this month, a Swiss court upheld the 12-month suspended sentence for a 47-year-old man who was convicted of deliberately removing his condom during sex with an unconsenting partner, charging him with defilement rather than rape, Swiss broadcaster SRF reported. In the UK, the law explicitly equates stealthing to rape, even though there is no legal precedent as yet. Quote, You're doing something that's quite deliberate, which you don't have permission for. If that is penetrative sex, then that is a definition of rape, said Sandra Paul, a partner in the law firm Kingsley Napley, who specializes in sexual crime. I think there are, let's say, let's unpack this issue a little bit. On the one hand, we have the act of stealthing, of a man, or an, I don't think the Wisconsin law is actually sex specific. It says actors and it talks about all kinds of sexual pre health prevention devices like dental dams and other things. So I don't know that that one is targeted just at men as being capable of engaging in this. I think it's important here to set aside these issues into two different camps. On the one side, there's the issue of cons the lack of consent and removing a condom midway during sex. So let's just set aside what it's classified legally as in various places. Let's just look at the act itself. Clearly, if you have sex with someone on the agreement that you're going to use a condom and halfway through he takes it off, then there is, uh, you, you don't have consent to, for an uncovered penis. So the question then becomes, how do we classify this violation of the other person's consent? They didn't agree to have a condomless penis. And I'm not going to assume here that the person being penetrated is a woman. It could be a man too. And we can understand with health reasons why that's particularly dangerous. But this has been directed at women as a form of passive aggressive dominance behavior. Then the question becomes, what kind of crime is this? I know that in the California law and in the UK law, there are links there with the concept of rape. I think in the Wisconsin law, there is a discussion of the term sexual battery. I personally think that sexual battery, if it exists in the law, makes a lot more sense than trying to equate what is on the surface consensual sex, but it's really deceptive sex. Because you're having sex under false pretenses, you're also potentially exposing that person against their will to either pregnancy or some sort of sexually transmitted infection. Therefore, it should be a crime. I don't personally, again, think that it makes the most sense to call it a form of rape. 
I think it makes a lot of sense to call it sexual battery. However, lawyers and legislators, people who draft this legislation, end up classifying this, whether it's considered sexual battery or rape. I just want to thank the heroines of the gynocracy for introducing legislation that even gets this conversation started. Obviously, introducing legislation is the start of a process, it's not the end of the process, but you can't deal with a problem if you don't introduce the legislation. So hats off to the women who are taking the lead on addressing this issue that affects not only women, but men as well. Heroines of the gynocracy! The next story covers what happens when women aren't in the room where it happens, <laughs> to quote a line from Hamilton. The Republicans in the Senate tried to pass their own version of a, an Obamacare repeal plan. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell decided the best way to do that would be to put 13 men in a room to write out the legislation that would reorganize a sixth of the U.S. economy. And even from that 13, he actually ended up using about four people in the main, all men, of course, who wrote the actual legislation. That legislation included a defunding of Planned Parenthood for a year, I believe, and a lot of legislation that impacted on women's health care and just generally the way that it organized payment to the states to support their public health programs. When the initial McConnell proposal went down in flames, he tried to revive his prospects by declaring they would just repeal Obamacare now and figure out how to replace it later. Well, that's when the revenge of the Republican women happened. From Vox, three GOP women were left out of the Senate's Obamacare repeal effort. They just tanked it. It's the revenge of the Republican women, Associated Press congressional reporter Alan Fram pointed out, as it's become apparent that Republicans would soon have no choice but to throw in the towel on their Obamacare repeal efforts. By Tuesday afternoon, three Republican senators, all women, had come out against Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's plan to push a vote on a clean Obamacare repeal bill, enough to sink it altogether. Senators Susan Collins, Shelley Moore Capito, and Lisa Murkowski confirmed they would not vote for a repeal bill that delayed enacting the policy by two years. On Monday night, two key defections killed the Senate's revised health care bill. Voting on a clean repeal bill appeared to be McConnell's Hail Mary effort to get his conference to vote on some form of Obamacare repeal. But gripes around a closed legislative process and what would only be more uncertainty to come with a successful repeal and delay bill tanked the effort in less than a day. It's notable that the three women who had the final say, vocal in their opposition on health care policy, were all cut out of the Senate's initial working group to draft the Obamacare repeal and replace bill, a group of 13 men. This next story is a bit of a follow-up, and it's just because I like to hear Rush Limbaugh cry. Rush Limbaugh fumes three liberal women in GOP running the Senate. <laughs> Rush Limbaugh was shrill and surly today after the Senate bill collapsed and singled out Senators Collins, Murkowski, and Capito for tanking Trump's plans to destroy health care in America. After his failure to pass a replacement bill in the Senate, Majority Leader McConnell decided to push a clean Obamacare repeal bill, but by mid-afternoon, Senators Collins, Murkowski, and Capito all said they'd vote against it. Rush said, quote, the Republican caucus in the Senate is infected with essentially leftist members. These three female leftists in the Republican caucus are running the Senate, not Mitch McConnell. Rush continued, these three liberal women who call themselves Republicans are running the Senate. Yeah, that's what happens when women think for themselves, Rush. Yes, cry for me, Rush. I love the glistening of wetness along your cheeks as Republican women who make sensible policy decisions frustrate your attempts to completely destroy social services and the social safety net. <laughs> Our last hero today is a woman who showed us that laughter is free speech. Judge Toss's conviction of woman who laughed during Sessions hearing. A Washington, D.C. judge on Friday tossed out a jury's conviction and called for a new trial for a protester who laughed during Attorney General Jeff Sessions' confirmation hearing. Desiree Ferruz, a Code Pink activist who was originally convicted of disrupting Sessions' Senate hearing in May, was given a new trial date of September 1st, according to D.C. Superior Court documents. 
At the hearing, authorities accused Fairuz of disrupting the proceedings with her laughter. She was convicted of parading or demonstrating on capital grounds and disorderly conduct. Chief Judge Robert E. Morin of the Superior Court of the District of Columbia tossed out the guilty verdict because the government had argued that the laugh itself was enough to warrant it. Morin said laughter would not be sufficient to submit the case to the jury, and so the government hadn't made clear before the trial it intended to make that argument, according to the Huffington Post. Fairuz maintained that when Senator Richard Shelby said Sessions' record of treating all Americans equally under the law is clear and well documented early in the hearing, she couldn't help but laugh. I just couldn't hold it in, she told the New York Times. It was spontaneous. It was an immediate rejection of what I considered an outright lie or pure ignorance, unquote. I think spontaneous laughter is clearly a form of free speech. The idea that the government can regulate spontaneous laughter is absolutely ridiculous. I wish Ms. Ferruz all the luck in the world and having her charges thrown out, and I'm sorry for the inconvenience. And if people in a hearing room can't handle a little bit of laughter, I don't think they're ready for politics. All right, everyone, this has been Helens of the Democracy. I will be back in the very near future with more episodes of This Week in Stupid Misogynists, maybe another few episodes of Heroines of the Gynocracy, which again includes men. I'm including men in the phrase heroines, just like we can call women guys. We're going to include men in the subset of Heroines of the Gynocracy. So until next time, guys, I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I will be talking with you again very soon. Bye-bye. Heroines of the Gynocracy